What does life hold for philosophy majors? I decided to find out. Welcome to Life After Philosophy. I'm Christopher Annadale. Welcome to Life After Philosophy. Our guest today is Olivia Angst. She is an English teacher at Catoctin High School in Thurmont, Maryland. She teaches mainly ninth and 10th graders and has been teaching for six years. She's married with two sons. She is a 2014 graduate of Mount St. Mary's University with a double major in English and philosophy. She wrote her honors project on Thomas Aquinas's view of mercy in light of Portia's speech on mercy in Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. She was a student of the late Trudy Conway. Olivia, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. So I'm, uh, I'd love to know sort of what, what value you found from your philosophy degree as a high school English teacher nearby, as it turns out, uh, to, to campus. But um, it's been been nine years, and you've been teaching for six, and you've, you've gone through some major life events. You've gotten married. You've had children. What does the life of a philosophy major look like, you know, almost a decade farther on for, for someone like you? So I kind of happened into the philosophy major. I knew I really loved English, and I wanted to pursue that. I wanted to study literature and eventually teach, and I took the required intro to philosophy classes. And then when I took the second one, I had Dr. Conway and really connected with her. And from there, it just kind of went on. And I just realized that philosophy and English have amazing connections. And I think using those connections helped me in both. I think I succeeded in English and philosophy with my majors because I was able to talk about Aristotle in my essay about Jane Austen or talk about Aquinas in my honors project about Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. So I was able to just kind of tie in moral teachings or philosophical ideas and it just really meshed well together. And I think that kind of has set my life in motion after even graduating from the Mount. So I just seeing how things can connect, I ended up staying at the Mount and I pursued my master's in teaching. So that's where that three-year gap was. I mm -hmm. um, ended up getting my master's of arts in teaching so that I could be a certified English teacher before even jumping into teaching. And even with that, like I was able to then stay on at the Mount, work at the Mount, and I could, I jumped into some English, English and philosophy classes still while I was getting my master's, which was wonderful. As a teacher, as an English teacher specifically, I found that philosophy just kind of finds me. So for instance, the other um, assignment I gave back in the spring for my 10th graders who, so I teach an accelerated 10-11 class where they're taking both 10th grade and 11th grade English in one year. So that way they can take like college level classes, their junior and senior year. Wow. So they're, they're very bright students, honors level, trying to achieve many credits at once. So I always push them to research further and try to acquire like higher thinking. And so for instance, I had a student who wanted to do a research project on friendship. So then I pushed her to study Aristotle. And I, I love, I love Aristotle's whole conception of the good, the useful. Oh, I forgot the good, the useful and the pleasant. Mm -hmm. Ooh, couldn't the remember pleasant, the third yes. one. Yes. Pleasant friendship. So I pushed mm -hmm. her to research that and then she tied that into her essay and it was wonderful. So there's little moments like that where I'm able to tie in my philosophy degree in my. Have, have, have you found that, uh, that, that high school students that you work with are, uh, are open to, you know, reading someone like Aristotle and, and sort of getting it on their own without, you know, of, of the framework of an actual class devoted to that? Yes, I have some students who really love when I tie in something, like I'll mention a philosophical idea and I'll say, oh, you could read more about this. And then they'll ask me after class to read more. I have students who started a Shakespeare society that I'm advising. Um, oh, wow. We haven't started a philosophy group yet, but I think we could get there for sure. I think I have enough students who would be interested. So hopefully, eventually, philosophy is not really a big curriculum piece in mm -hmm. Frederick County for high schoolers, but I would love to eventually teach a philosophy class too, if possible. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's great. I, I wonder, uh, yeah, some people might think, okay, English teacher, high school English teacher, 
I, you know, I, I could get a certificate for that. I could, I could major in education to do that. What, what's been your experience now? You've been teaching for six years, and I, I hear you sort of dropping new things in there. There's some connections you can draw. Is there anything else you can think of that sort of enriches the way that you approach English, having been a philosophy major? I So as an, a teacher, especially as a public school teacher, you're required to get certain credits as you continue on. And I think being a philosophy major has helped me in the pursuit of always wanting to acquire more knowledge, always wanting to study more, improving myself, improving my pedagogy, my strategies for teaching. And I think that truly is founded in my philosophy major in the sense of I learned so much about bettering myself as a philosophy major, always trying to challenge myself, whether it's learning a new concept or taking something that I believe to be true and looking at different perspectives. So mm -hmm. that's, I can definitely apply that even as a teacher when I'm learning new concepts. Oh, maybe the strategy that I think is great isn't actually great and isn't actually helping students. So then I'm pursuing new strategies and trying to keep my mind open to that. And I think my philosophy major definitely helped with that. That's excellent. Uh, can you think of any ways that do you, do you sometimes, how shall I say this? Do you sometimes feel like you're kind of channeling Trudy Conway? Do there, there are some some things that she did or said that you think come out in the way that you relate to your students, the, the, the sort of ambitions you have for them and the way you try to realize them? Yes, she was so passionate about everything she taught, and especially like I know for sure the death penalty. I didn't even realize I cared so much about the death penalty until I took her classes. And I even had the opportunity to go with her to DC to a conference. And that's something again, where I know so much about the death penalty because of her and her passion for it and the different perspectives that she taught me on it, that then I can like, when students, when I give them a research project where they get to debate and they get to say, oh, this is where I stand on this topic. I'm like, oh, let me push you a little bit. If you're going to do the death penalty, look at all these other perspectives. And it's, so I always am thinking about her with that. Another big thing that she taught me was Martha Nussbaum, um, the philosopher. She talks about the moral imagination and that's such a beautiful connection to teaching literature. So the idea that the more you read, the better understanding you have of other people's perspectives and the stronger your empathy grows and that's something I try to instill in all my students like we need to read these books that don't maybe relate to you or you're not familiar with because you're learning other people's perspectives and it's helping create your moral imagination that's great you find students receptive to that then yes definitely that's definitely great. yeah you know one one of one of my memories of Trudy is her ability to read people very accurately. She, I, I had worked with a certain student for a long time and thought I knew him quite well. And then I had a conversation with Trudy after she'd had him in a couple of class sessions. She'd maybe spent a few hours with him and her her insights into sort of where he was and what he needed as a student and, and what what was possible for him really just blew me away. I mean, it, it, I realize we're, we're reminiscing here about a, about a, a colleague and a friend but uh, that's one of the things that always really um, I really admired about her was that she could, I think she could see right into the heart of people, probably from, you know, decades and decades of experience, you know, doing what she did and being who she was. Did you I, ever, I would, ever have an experience like that with her? I wouldn't have been a philosophy major if it wasn't for her. Just like I said, when I took her class, I just really connected with her. And I think she saw something in me that I didn't realize because I didn't do super well. Um, in the first philosophy class, like the first required one, I didn't really connect with the professor. I didn't really like, the, like I I, got, I got understood the content, but I didn't do super well with it. Um, it was actually, I think my lowest grade in college. So then I was like, I kind of begrudgingly took the second one that was required. But then with her, I just connected and we soared. Like it was just, it was amazing. I remember just feeling so comfortable in her office. Every time we would talk, she would just be like, okay, you should read this. And it was just something I needed at that time. And it was something that really challenged me and helped me make those connections with English, my English classes or my personal life. And yeah, she was, I truly would not be a philosophy major if it wasn't for her. So I'm very grateful. Yeah. I, I wonder if everybody has somebody like that in their past, especially in, in college. And I, I don't know if it's more prominent in philosophy than in other disciplines, but I'm, I certainly remember my my mentors in undergraduate and then in, in graduate school and how how personally important they were for me. 
you think that happens at the high school level as well? I know you're you're trying to be what 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 you can be for your students, but how has that played out in the, the, the beginning of your career? I definitely sh- like have been striving to be that teacher to students, and it's just I think like Dr. Conway was able to do just trying to connect to students and see them where they are, try to meet them at their level, and try to connect to their interests, try to connect to them but then also challenge them that's something I definitely try to do with my high school students and I've only been in the high school for four years so the class that just graduated I started with them when they were freshmen so I've only been able to see it with four classes of students but yes I I think not that I'm their favorite teacher but they definitely say that like I've stood out and made connections and made English something that they really hated in middle school and maybe at the start of their high school career. But then with me, it was something that they like really started to like. And it's it's wonderful to hear those comments, but truly I just am trying to connect to them, trying to say like, no, you need to read because reading does help you become a better person, truly. Mm-hmm. Like it's not just to help you be smarter. I'm not really worried about like how many pages you read or whatever it is. I need you to just learn from the characters. I need you to learn how to analyze and talk about things outside of just your small world. Olivia, what do you think are the prospects for a kind of formal study of philosophy in high schools? I know the curriculum is packed and it's difficult to cover everything. Do you think students would profit from uh, classes in philosophy if that were possible? Or is it uh, be more the case that it'd be best to approach it on a kind of ad hoc basis, trying to combine it into English and whatever history and whatever other courses like that would, would be out there? That would be very cool to try to combine it maybe with history and English just so that way the students are getting their required because like you said like there's a lot that they have to get in within that four years that's required for them to graduate like for instance they have to have an English they have to have four Englishes right which is a lot like that's that keeps their schedule pretty structured then right and the same with math and then science and history so like the main four but I think what's, what I'm finding recently for high school students is that it's amazing how many more college level classes they're taking. So like when I was in high school, whatever it was, 14 years ago, AP mm-hmm. was super big. Like we took AP classes so we could get AP credits and then maybe could not take a class in college. Like I didn't have to take a science at the Mount because I did well on the AP chem exam. So it was right. things like that that was pushed for students. Now it's like, college level classes like taking frederick county community college classes so the kids are taking multiple classes i have a i have three students that i taught this year who are now going into an early college program so they're going to have their associate's degree and their high school diploma by the end of their high school career so even beyond ap they're actually going into actually doing college classes while still in high school i think i've heard of that i didn't realize it was such a big thing now it's becoming really, really big, like to the point where whenever we need to hire another English teacher, because our teachers are close to, not like they're close to retirement within the next like Mm -hmm. two, three years, we're going to have to hire for somebody who has that ability to teach both high school level classes, like ninth and 10th grade English, but then also Mm -hmm. the college level courses. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me ask you about other other areas of life. I was talking a little bit about your career, about teaching, which is something that you and I have in common. In fact, now that I think about it, I, I was an English and philosophy double major myself uh, way, way back <laughs> in the day. Any other areas of your life where you, you think, you know, this is a place where philosophy, my study of philosophy or just my encounter with Trudy Conway has prepared me in a way that I, I would have been blindsided or, or less well prepared if, if I hadn't? maybe in my own like personal faith journey too, to Mm -hmm. some extent. So like I am a practicing Catholic and I definitely grew stronger in my faith at the Mount. And I Mm -hmm. think my philosophy background helped with that. Like I think I, I, so I did the Mountward Bound trip, which I cannot recommend enough to people. I think that was such a great thing that my mom signed me up for because I got like truly my best friends that I'm still friends with are the ones that I met on that Mountward Bound before starting my fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Like I made such amazing connections, but Mm -hmm. I started. So when I joined, I did the retreat one and I, my faith got really strong then. Like I was like, okay, I'm now an adult. I need to make this decision and I'm going to make it. But I think I really 
intellectually grew with a philosophy major. And then since college, I've been able to go back to that. So like if I am struggling with something or I just need to challenge myself to think of a different perspective, I'll pick up a philosophy book. Like right now I'm reading um, Peter Kreef's uh, philosophy of Tolkien. So it's like the Lord of the Rings and looking at philosophical ideas that he tied in to Lord of the Rings. And I, I know that because I had the philosophy background, I can understand it a lot better. Like it, I don't think I would have been able to just pick up a philosophy book if I hadn't Mm -hmm. studied it so much in um, college. So I think that's helped me a lot with just like connecting to my interests, like Lord of the Rings, Mm -hmm. Jane Austen. I love Jane Austen. I have always loved Jane Austen, but especially in college and then beyond. And I'm able to see like the moral choices that the characters make and like, Mm -hmm. So yes, in ways like that, but then also like personally with my kids. So my, I don't know if I, if you know this, but my three-year-old has leukemia. I didn't know that. No. Yeah. He was diagnosed uh, right before Christmas. And Mm -hmm. so it's about six months now that he's been through treatment. And even with that, like, it's been hard, but knowing like that I have my strong foundation in my faith and that if I am struggling, I can reach out to I guess looking at different philosophical ideas, looking at the saints, looking at the catechism. I'm also doing the catechism catechism in a year wow. with Father Mike Schmitz um, mm-hmm. right now. And that's that's pretty dense too. So like looking at that, but then also knowing my background, my faith background, my philosophical background, it's really helped me to stay calm and trust that God has a plan. So yeah, I think personally, it does, definitely has helped. One of the words that I sometimes use in seminary and even with with undergraduates is integration, that that philosophy gives you this kind of intellectual basis on which you can integrate the rest of your life. You can pull things together and feel that you're a whole person instead of being divided up into pieces and trying to, you know, juggle plates and balance the parts of yourselves against each other. Has there been a sense of wholeness, you think, to, to your life, whether it's the result of philosophy or not? Yes, definitely. I think whenever I'm feeling broken or upset or lost, whenever I reground myself in the Bible, in philosophical ideas that I know to be true about God, about why we're here, what we're looking forward to out, out of this life, I think it like it brings me back and it helps me feel whole again, like you said. Like I I definitely see that integration. And then even like I said, like I always try to combine literature and philosophy. It's just what I naturally did in college and have been doing for the last nine years. I even when I'm reading just for fun, if it's not not even a school book or like a book I'm going to teach, just a book for myself, I try to look at the characters and I'm like, okay, are they making good moral decisions or and if they're not, what should they be doing? What how can I integrate a lesson from this into my own life? So definitely I see that integration. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. Thanks. Thanks very much for sharing that. I wonder if you had any advice for philosophy majors, potential philosophy majors, people who maybe are in your position who might not yet have found their Trudy Conway. Is is there anything you might say to them if they're thinking, you know, should I add a philosophy minor, a major? Should I consider this? Or should I really, you know, take take a path that I'm, I'm maybe more comfortable with? What sorts of advice could you give to to people like that? So when I think back to adding on the philosophy major, I think of it as a time of like, wow, that was a time in my life where I chose something because I enjoyed it. And I'm really glad that I did that. Like, I'm glad that I chose to add that major because I was enjoying those classes. And like, they weren't easy. I remember your class, I took your philosophy of science class. And that was just a little bit tricky for me because science was never my thing. So like, (laughs) looking at that perspective, And then another big thing, I think in your class, there may have been one or two other females, but I was usually the only female and usually the only one of like three undergrads. I took a lot of classes with seminarians. So that was a challenge in the sense that like I didn't really connect. I couldn't really have like a study group as much as in my English classes. So there's challenges there. There were challenges with all the essays that you need to write and the analysis that you have to do. But I think it's worth it. I think especially if you like, I'm, I'm so glad I did it. I was able to pick philosophy classes that interested me. So like I was able to take um, Dr. Conway's class on the death penalty. I was able to take 
I think back, so one of the ones that was really challenging was logic. That was another one for me. So, but there, I think back to that all the time and I'm so glad I took that class because I think it's helped me a lot, especially like, yes, I teach high schoolers, but there's some high schoolers that I teach that are, I'm, they're like firm that they're going to be lawyers or they're going to um, go to law school. And I'm like, okay, well, you're going to need to know some logic. So then I like, at least introduce them to that even in high school. And I know that. So I have that perspective. It's nice to have like so much that I can, like you said, integrate from my philosophy degree. But yeah, Mm -hmm. I would definitely recommend if it's something that interests you. I'm so glad I did it. I'm so glad that I was able to pursue something that made me happy and challenged me in many Mm -hmm. ways. I I don't want to ask an unfair question, but let me at least venture this. Do you have any thoughts or, or comments based on your experience about what it's like being a woman in philosophy? which is kind of notoriously a, a male dominated field or a male tilted field. And of course, some other fields are are female tilted. But of course, there's Trudy Conway, there's other female professors we've had in our department. Uh, either both that question and then maybe also the, the question of, you know, being a woman student studying with uh, a woman professor, Dr. Conway, what was the dynamic there? And what was your sort of feeling about the boundaries of of what was available to you in in the classroom and outside of the classroom. Go ahead, please. My first thought when you asked that was more like thinking about all the philosophers that I studied. They were majority male. Like I think 90 some percent were male writers. And then, but the ones that stick with me are the females. So like Martha Nussbaum, there's one that I can't remember her last name. I just remember her first name was Karen, but she's a philosophy professor, I think in DC. And she wrote a lot of- Yes. So I had studied her because I had gotten recommendations from Dr. Conway and um, mm-hmm. Dr. Hines to study her because she talks about um, Jane Austen. So like, I remember the, the females, which is interesting. That, 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 is, that gives me some, some, uh, some food for thought about uh, planning my, my curriculum in the, uh, in the coming years. Yes, adding more diversity there. Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. I, I think also as a female, like I, it was it was challenging to be in the class with like mostly seminarians, but it was also yeah. really good for me to have a new perspective and to see like, I was, I was able to connect to the seminarians at least socially in class. And mm-hmm. um, it was good to hear their perspectives. Sometimes they would be speaking above me in the sense of they had been taking more philosophy classes and they also knew each other. So that was challenging at times. Right. But I tried to ground myself in, okay, this is what this, is saying like I would read whatever text we were on and then I also maybe I supplemented somewhat with my English degree like reading Mm -hmm. a lot of female perspectives I took a lot of female women writers in my English so maybe I was trying to balance it there but yeah definitely Mm -hmm. please add more (laughs) female philosophers (laughs) (laughs) do you think there's anything about the uh, anything about Nussbaum and Murdoch and Storr and the others about the content of their thought uh, that that attracted you or that or, or the style in which they express it I don't know. I, so style wise, I loved the ancient philosophers a lot more than the modern philosophers. Like I really Mm -hmm. did not connect with the modern philosophers, but then the modern ones that I did connect with, I think were mostly female in the sense of maybe it was the content of what they were talking about and the things that they focused in on. So like with Martha Nussbaum, that moral imagination, that was such a clear connection for me with why I love reading. I love reading Mm -hmm. to learn new perspectives. So maybe it was the content of what they were writing because yeah, I do not like modern philosophers. Like I had the hardest time in that class. I love, if I could just study Aristotle, Aquinas, Mm -hmm. like I would have been, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Well, it's it's, it's great. It's good news. That's that's something for me and for, uh, for my colleagues to reflect on then as well, trying to, uh, trying to prepare the next, the next Olivia uh, for, uh, for life. So I appreciate your time, taking the time to be on the podcast today, Olivia. Uh, our get, my guest has been Olivia Angst, um, high school teacher and 2014 graduate of Mount St. Mary's University. Thanks again, Olivia. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Life After Philosophy. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate it five stars and share this episode with a friend. I appreciate your support.